Hi, welcome to the PACT podcast. My name is Ollie Huggins. I'm VP of Partnerships at PACT. And I'm joined here by John Goyasos, who's a CIO at both Mike Morse Law Firm and also Fireproof Performance. Great to see you, John. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to hear from you about the CIO role. I think about your journey from where you started to where you are now. So just kick things off. Talk to me about how you became the CIO at Mike Walsh Law Firm. What's the journey that led to you to where you are now? Uh, it was a long journey. I uh, I started in IT a long, long time ago. Uh, I didn't come out of university with um, with a particular degree focused on becoming a CIO. I yeah. came out with some technology background. And I was fortunate to have worked for some uh, large organization that allowed me to kind of flourish. Um, I started off as a sort of low level help desk technician. Um, I serviced, you know, I think over four or 500 organizations at the time. Uh, I worked yeah. for WPP, which uh, is one of the largest big advertising holding companies in, in the world. And uh, I started there. I started at the advertising uh, agency uh, for Gemini Rubicam before I came over to the holding company. Good. And uh, and that started my journey. And what looking back, reflecting back, it was probably one of the best things I, I did because as I, as I grew from role to role, I understood every level. So when I eventually did become a CIO, I was, I was more sympathetic to the IT managers and the, the IT directors and the IT help desk technicians and the network yep. administrators because I had done that. Um, so I started at WPP. Uh, when I came over to the holding company, I sort of got promoted over the years. I, you know, I had various roles. I was a project manager at one point. Uh, but the, 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 the most difficult role reflecting back that I ever had was becoming an IT manager, uh, right. even more so than, than being a CIO actually, because it was the, First time I was sort of letting go of, of becoming a technical person and now becoming adapting these soft skills of managing people, managing emotions, managing a larger team. And then as I transitioned from IT manager to IT director, that became a little bit harder because then I had to sort of balance the politics of the bureaucracy of, you know, uh, being a little bit more diplomatic, um, managing a, a budget, managing a PL. Uh, yeah. and having finance hat that I didn't have before. Um, and so, you know, those formative years uh, helped me become a better skill, you know, from skill set standpoint, helped me become uh, a CIO today, but a better CIO in my opinion. Uh, as I transformed through the journey, uh, of course, I had uh, the privilege of working with some good CIOs, uh, I also did not have a, I wouldn't call it trigger worth of the CIOs that um, weren't the greatest uh, when yeah. I, you know, reflecting back. Um, and it, it wasn't just, it wasn't personality, it was just how they led, uh, how they managed a particular transformation. And so um, through various other transformations, I managed to learn a lot of things. And then I sort of said to myself, you know, if I ever became a CIO, um, I would definitely not repeat those mistakes, but I would I would sort of focus on uh, becoming an investor in technology, investing in the right technology, making the right sort of decisions. Uh, mm. Most CIOs during my journey that I had met, I, I now reflect back and I call them sort of the CFOs uh, disguised as CTOs. So they, were more, <laughs> yeah. they were more business-driven uh, sort of, you know, looking more at cost efficiency versus actually making the proper investment in technology. And so I, I couldn't understand that. And uh, I was always sort of the loudest uh, voice in the in the room for a bit of that. Um, and uh, when my journey at, at WPP sort of came to an end, I I sort of said, what, what did I want to do next? And um, I got two phone calls, actually. Mm -hmm. One from uh, Jason Camerata. He was the chief operating officer or, or about to become the chief operating officer for NPC Partners. It was a smaller uh, holding company in the in the advertising arena. 
And at the same time, I had just gotten a phone call from uh, Mark Penn. He was the uh, he was about to become the chief uh, executive officer for Embassy Partners. Embassy Partners, smaller uh, holding company. They had about five thousand people. And when you compare that to WPP, which WPP had two hundred thousand people worldwide, twenty billion dollars in revenue, uh, four hundred plus office, offices worldwide. All of a sudden, different beasts. Yeah, <laughs> different beasts. And when I got the phone call, they, they, they knew about me from a reputation, uh, mm. at again, good or bad reputation. I don't know, but they, they knew of me. Mark Penn actually had sold this company to WPP. So he had heard about me. He had heard that I had pretty thick skin. I had worked under Sir Martin Sorrell at the time. So he's like, well, if anybody work under Martin Sorrell, sure. you know, he can work under me. <laughs> and, uh, Mark had a vision of turning the company around. The company was not yep. doing very well. Uh, I think they were completely upside down. They were stock. The stock had traded at, in its highest glory at forty-five or thirty-five dollars, and then it dropped. It dropped down to almost a dollar. And uh, it was a very tough decision for me. I, you know, there was a big risk, but yep. there were huge upsides. So this was now my opportunity to finally become the CIO. They were yep. going to appoint me as CIO. Uh, so that was a little nerve wracking and, uh, um, the transformation was how do we, how do we turn the company around altogether, right? From, from an operation standpoint, from, from an executive standpoint, and then obviously from a technology. And so that became my, uh, my first journey of having evolved, becoming sort of a, an IT director, head of IT for America, as I think my title was at WBB now finally becoming a CIO. Um, and but presumably you've got a blank canvas coming into this organization. I had a, I had a blank canvas um, for sure, because now it allowed me to do what I needed to do. I had full authority from Mark Penn, mm. which was great because he gave me that autonomy. And uh, at the time I was reporting to, I had a dotted, I had, well, when you become a CIO, when you're in IT, you end up reporting to a lot of people. Uh, yeah, sure. Everybody, everybody's your boss, right? Because I, I sort of treat everybody as my client, and uh, mm. from from a junior analyst employee all the way up to somebody who's who's an executive, and that was sort of a, a a touch that I had not seen in previous CIOs, where that customer service came first. Yes, it was again that that I had um, the opportunity to work with. Always sort of treated themselves as the executive level, being sort of. 50,000 feet above the organization. And, and, and I understand that you can't as a CIO always be in the lead, but you have to be, mm. this is an understanding that's happening at all aspects, in my opinion. Yeah. You have to know what a weed looks like. You can't just be yeah. ignorant to the day-to-day -day workings of the team. Exactly. So, um, so yes, I did have a blank canvas. I had a ton of from, from the CEO, um, I just was... a quick one. Do you think that kind of level of autonomy that you've had? Yeah. is rare among CIOs? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Extremely rare because uh, most CIOs slash CTOs are governed by a CFO or CEO. Uh, they mm -hmm. don't give them enough autonomy. They don't give them enough decision-making. And so you're hindering them to be able to actually change uh, yeah. an organization. And, and that's what, in my opinion, the two priorities of CIO is, is making the right investments uh, in technology to be able to propel the business okay. and then be able to instill change. If you can't instill change, the organization isn't going to go anywhere. Yes. And so, uh, actually funny enough, one of my, in my contractual agreement was you have to leave me alone. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> me do my thing or, you know, I, I sorry, come out. Yeah. Uh, and, and between Jason and Mark, they were just amazing and, and just letting me do what I had to do. Um, and of course, it, it came with uh, trust and, and I had to show the proof was in the pudding, right? So I had yeah. to show that I was I was instilling good change and making things happen. Um, so to your point, I had a blank canvas. Um, I had, I sort of had a couple of decisions that I needed to make because again, the, the organization wasn't doing very well. We had 5,000 people. We had 50 agencies all working in a very decentralized way. Hmm. And so, and each agency had their own IT 
organization, right? So oh, in, some, okay. in some cases, actually, some agencies even have their own CIO. So sort of how do we, how do we, how do we transform this? How do I get these people to work with me? And two transformations or two particular transformations that I've seen is sort of the in-source model and the outsource model. And sure. I'll yeah. so both re really quickly. The outsource model is sort of the easy thing to do. Most CIOs use that as their standard blueprint. A CIO comes in, evaluates, and then starts, you know, putting on the chop block of who goes out, who leaves, and who do we hire to outsource. Yeah. And for the most part, <coughs> great on a from a PL standpoint and from a from a general ledger, but it hinders an organization because you do pay for what you get for and most outsourced uh, IT isn't the greatest. Hey. And so that looks great short term on paper. Long term it um, it not only hinders, it causes major negative disruption to the business. And I've seen that firsthand. Sure. The uh, other part of the transformation, depending on the organization, depending on the size of the organization, is an insert model. What does that mean? Well in my case at MDC was pulling all the existing IT talent together under yeah. one sort of new co or umbrella and having them work as a new team together with their knowledge transfer, bringing that all, uh, restructuring the team force and focusing on providing support to the entire group versus the siloed agencies that kind of go off and do their own thing. They have different technologies. Yeah. And stack and technology, and we're losing in many areas. We're losing procurement value, right? Because we're yeah. not working as one unit, uh, and we're, we're losing all sorts of things on security from security posture because everybody's doing something different, and so we're in a vulnerable state. And so that is the hardest thing to do. And most CIOs avoid doing that because why? Well, it's, it's simple. Bringing people together isn't the easiest thing. Having people. Maybe. My old boss, my old Martin used to say one of the most difficult things he used to have to do was uh, as he acquired agencies was having them play in the sandbox together. That's what he okay. said, right? And, and working together as a team, regardless of your competition, to achieve one goal and, and bring new business. And so I, saw, I sort of thought the same way. I said, well, there's definitely good talent. And there's probably talent that is not going to be happy as they move over because I'm taking them, I'm changing their environment, right? I'm taking them out of their comfort zone. I'm taking them out of their little village and I'm putting them somewhere new, new and they might not be interested in, in that. So we had that, had that task. I had an additional task where I had to actually get rid of, um, well, I had to, uh, I had to figure out activities. And one of the things that I noticed that all these companies had in common was not only did they have their own IT department, each one of these agencies actually outsourced IT also to a MSP, a managed service provider. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. Now we have a bunch of- see how many of those managed service provider relationships did you have? 50. 50. And, <laughs> 50, and I had to figure out a way, how do we get that down to one zero? Yeah. And uh, within one month, I got rid of all 50. Uh, yeah. MSPs. And, and that was a little scary because the, the COOs and CFOs of the, of the businesses had established relationships with these MSPs. Of course. So yeah. First reaction was like, are you kidding me? They provide great, amazing service. And I would look at the, um, I would look at the, the P&L and I was like, well, they're charging you a hell of a lot of money and I don't see how they, they can provide great service. Cause I'm looking at your mm -hmm. technology stack and excuse my French, it's garbage. It's, it's shit. Uh, and so they would get naturally upset. And luckily, because of the autonomy I was given, I was able to make those executive decisions. So I said, do me a favor. I'm going to cut them loose. What's the worst sure. thing? You can always bring them back, right? Let's cut them loose. I cut them loose two, three months, go, go, uh, you know, go past and uh, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Everybody was expecting this doomsday and nothing happened. We were just fine. And so it, it further instilled that I was yeah, in that confidence in me of, okay, I'm making the right decisions. I, I know what I'm doing here. And so now the hard part was how do I bring everybody together? So we had to create a new co, a new company, uh, because at the end of the day, regardless of my autonomy, regardless of my leadership, uh, people 
tend to listen to who writes their paycheck. <laughs> yeah, they're correct. <laughs> when if their paycheck said their agency name, that's who they're going to report to. They're going to report it to their CFO and their uh, HR at that agency level. So that that wasn't going to help me a lot, especially on decision making. Because and I noticed that quite quickly as I was asked to, to do things, they would run back to their counter COO or CFO and say, John. John G asked me to do this, and they'd be like, "No, don't, you don't have to do that." Yeah. It hinder me, and so I yeah. had to make that quick decision. Yeah, 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 yeah. Move everybody now, and that was a little excruciating. With the help of Jason, he, he was such an amazing partner. He helped me structure the business correctly. We had to bring benefits in. I mean, we're creating, yeah. you right, and and uh, and as I'm doing all that. In addition to to that, now we had a bigger task at hand. We had to actually migrate. 13 agencies all scattered around New York under a uh, new office in um, the Freedom Tower where the uh, Twin Towers used to exist in, uh, in, in downtown New York. Um, and that was interesting because everybody still had the whole 9-11 in the back of their head. They weren't quite, you know, motivated to move down to downtown. And that was going to help us consolidating 13 agencies that were paying extravagant rent in New York City, consolidating it all under one space, creating sort of a hub or centralized hub or a campus, if you like, yeah. where we can bring these agencies together. We can revamp their, their technology stack and have them actually work together as sort of a complementary agency because we had a it was 200,000 square feet in a One World Trade Center raw space that we had to build out. We had $30 million in budget, which I can assure you might sound like a lot. It's, it's not. It's not a lot downtown New York, right? <laughs> New York in a unionized building where everything is super expensive. Yeah. Uh, $30 million doesn't get you very much. But with that $30 million, we had a revamp for technology stack. We had a built raw space. We had to get furniture. We had to paint. All sorts yeah. of things, right? And so... Um, and and it's quite easy for somebody to just take, um, migrate, a, a, you know, call it a house, right? Migrate your house and just take all your stuff and move it here. Yeah. The, the interesting thing we're doing in this particular case, we're like, no, 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 you're not bringing any of your stuff in in this new space. We're going to move you to the cloud. Every single agency, we have to put a plan in to move all your stack to the cloud. And we're going to put a new network infrastructure. We're going to put new printers. Uh, we're going to do everything new. This way, when you move into the building, uh, the technology is fresh and new, and, and it's complementary to the goal and the vision that Mark and Jason have, which yeah. is creating a campus where everybody can kind of work together. So whether you're working at a different agency, you can kind of walk around the office and you can print at any printer. Or the, the, the network is seamless across the, the, the five floors. Or the security is seamless. Yeah. You can just kind of hit your badge, you go wherever you need to go. And the idea was to further enhance the collaboration. Uh, now, so I have the overall, you know, in-source model that I'm trying to transform. I have this new company that we're trying to build. We got the 50 MSPs that I, you know, I had the agenda of pushing them out. And we have this big project of migrating to, uh, to this new campus, all happening kind of at the same time. And then COVID hits. And it's like, holy shit, can I ask That's for a real shit? I'm walking out and like, is God just penalizing me right now? Like, what the hell? Um, yeah. And so now I have. What stage of development were you at when COVID hits? And have people got like laptops? Have you, have you made the migration to the new campus? Yeah. It, all of it was in motion to be planned out. We actually had a plan that this was going to take about two years. Okay. And COVID hits. And I remember sitting in the boardroom and, and, and just like anybody else, right? Nobody knew what was. Nobody knew how long it was going to last. Nobody, nobody had a blueprint. It's not like we had a business continuity plan for nobody. Yeah. Right? And so we assume that it's only going to take a couple of days and we'll be back in the office. <laughs> we know, you know, we're going to be yeah, yeah. during those two years. Um, but the original transformation plan was going to take about two years. That's what, right. uh, that's what we had in, in motion. And uh, uh, we performed everything a little under a year. Uh, Amazing. Which, which was crazy thinking that I did all this. Of course, 
with the help of my team, right? I mean, in my opinion, without a great team, a good leader will fail and uh, a great team will, without a good leader will fail. That's how I want to get it. But it, it's quite amusing to me and surprising. <clears throat> and we did all this during that crazy time while I was in the basement of my old house commanding fleet of, of uh, 100 IT technicians that I had never met before. Yeah. I met, I met them all through teams, right? And we would have calls every day till 8, 9 o'clock at night. Um, and there were moments of stress. There were moments of, there were definitely moments that I, I probably, this is probably the first time I'll share on publicly on a podcast nonetheless of, there were definitely moments of, um, whether I was doing the right thing or not. Hey. Having been, having the background that I had, I was confident enough to have taken the role that I took, but there were definitely moments where even things such as. We're going to go wireless, 100% wireless at one World Trade Center. That was nuts. All the CFOs, CEOs of the agencies, of the respective agencies that we moved, hated me. They would literally yeah. call me today and be like, it's not going to work. Our, our, our network and our current agency sucks. And I would say to them, without trying to disrespect them too much, but you know, the reality is you guys built your technology stack and evolving it as you grew and you just patched things together. Nobody ever took it back to kind of revamp it. This is an opportunity to do so. If we depend in our home as consumers for wireless, and I don't know anybody, I don't even, my grandmother up in the village in Greenstreet uses wireless. If she can use wireless, we should be able to push, put a wireless up there. And I want to touch on that subject because it was really interesting. Yeah. It wasn't just moving in the direction of technology and we should be adapting something um, that's powerful. It was for many reasons. We were trying to increase that collaboration that I mentioned. Well, if yeah. you have people stationed at desks working behind a desktop and just anchored at their desk from nine to five, how they're expect how are they expected to move up, go into a conference room, use the technology stack, move around, collaborate with people if they're just anchored yeah. at the desk doing their work. And so in my eyes, I was already planning on giving the laptops. COVID just helped me accelerate it. I was going to ask you the question. Yeah. To what extent was COVID a feature and not a bug in Listen, playing into your hand? Yeah. That's a great question. I was about to actually go into that. Um, for many people, COVID obviously, look, uh, COVID hurt a lot. It hurt yeah. a lot of businesses. Where I was sitting, what I needed to do, uh, the goals that I had personally, it actually was helpful. It yeah. actually helped me because uh, it pushed us for change. It pushed it harder to change for, for us to change for agencies that were still using phones, which I couldn't believe it. I was walking around and I was like, Oh my God, because they're so using phones, uh, sure. uh, and, and that resistance of moving from physical phones into a teams or into an environment like this, uh, uh COVID helped accelerate that. They knew they, they didn't have a choice or their business would fail. So for, for, for the most part, COVID helped accelerate a lot of the change that I was looking to instill. So it was a positive thing for me. It didn't yeah. help me physically. I definitely gained a lot of weight during that time from the show. Uh, I became a functional alcoholic during COVID. So we all had a, we all had a things. Everybody, you know, there were people who were sort of losing weight and people who were gaining weight. I, I yeah. had a lot of stress. I had just finished watching that documentary on Netflix with uh, narrated by Arnold Schwarzenegger about uh, be, being a vegan. So I decided, yeah. Game changes, I remember that. Yeah, that. yeah I, I watched that documentary and just let the sucker. I said, you know what? If this can be 50% of what it claims to do, I need it right now. Because I'm about to go to war with all these changes and I, I need an edge. Uh, reflecting back, a lot of people asked me, did, did being vegan for a year help you? And I was like, well, I got the full information done, but I was always angry. I was always okay. just and angry. And that's how to push. Uh, I wouldn't, not the team. Because I, I think being angry and motivating by anger is not a great leadership trait. Uh, it hey. does not instill motivation, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, but it definitely gave me the edge to be able to stand up to certain people who were resisting to change, stand up yeah. to the vendors that were uh, a bit sluggish. Obviously, we had a lot of things that were going against us with COVID as well, not just the pluses that I mentioned before. So, hey. so an example was the chip shortage. All sorts of things that were shortage, shorting. Yeah, yeah chip shortage, yeah. Boring. We couldn't even get laptops on time. We couldn't get our network on time. And that put a lot more stress uh, on it. 
on the plus side, we were also the only company that was actually spending money during COVID. Because if you think about yeah, yeah, yeah. It, during COVID, everybody started pulling back on spend because nobody yeah. knew what's going to happen. And so not only were we pull, we were not pulling back on spend, we were spending money in order to make that investment to go to move into One World Trade Center to get that yeah. uh, technology stack. So, uh, so I had a lot of things going on. Uh, in addition to that, uh, and I knew this, right? As part of the in-source model, we knew some people are going to resist that change. Some people are going to quit. We're going to weed out some people are, that are probably not the greatest performer. So that yeah. was a, that was in a fun part of the of the role, but that was a necessary part of the role of you know yeah. making sure that we had the right fit talent to be able to support the transformation. And yeah, I was so, going to ask you a little bit more about the, that whole piece in terms of bringing all of those different IT professionals together from disparate agencies who yeah. presumably all have their own thoughts and ideas and egos yeah. uh, that they're bringing to the table. Yeah. You're then trying to bring them together into a new organization during COVID. So these people have not had the chance to meet in person. Talk to me a little bit about how you lent into kind of the remote technologies you had available and, and how you leveraged those to create uh, yeah. cohesion and, and the culture within that team well i mean they had their own culture coming from the, the agencies that they had and now yeah. i build a, a new type of culture uh a culture of a unified team and like i said there were definitely some people who were on board and definitely people who were not on board and definitely the, some of the people that were not on board didn't make it easy yeah um so and meeting them through a screen and not having not ha not being able to have that kind of human element, being able to go out for a drink or let's go, let me take everybody for a nice meal out and let's Please. just enjoy ourselves. Definitely doesn't make it better. Uh, but uh, I've tried. I remember. So so again, during COVID, right? Uh, there were a lot of um, furloughs happening, Please. right? And so. I was able to retain 98 to 99% of the entire team. Okay. And what I was able to do was shift them around. Part of this in source model was to take an agency that unfortunately needed that furlough. I would take that IT person and I would move them to an agency that actually needed more support and could have. Yeah. And so that balance. Uh, at the time, <clears throat> The team, and, and not to speak badly about them, but the team did not see that, they didn't see that as a benefit, right? right. Uh, I actually gave out bonuses that year where everybody was not giving out bonuses. Were the bonuses great? No. So in some cases, you know, it would be $500, $1,000, which let, let's be honest, after taxes, really not much, but it was it's something, something yeah. right? And, and during the time that nobody was giving out bonuses, and again, that was part of Jason and my my sort of idea, like how do we motivate these people, right? How yeah. do we, because because that could have been really bad. Also, if people just got up and said, you know what, we don't need to work. Uh, yeah. We can just go up on our employment. We can get all these COVID benefits and stuff. Screw John and this vision. We don't need him. And now I'm left with a model that I thought was going to work, and it was going to go down. So that could have easily happened. And actually, for for a good part. I used to say that Fridays were my favorite days. Yeah. Almost ended up becoming my worst days because at, on Friday, every time like a like a perfect engine, I would get the phone call from HR at five six o'clock in the afternoon. Somebody's leaving, or somebody's uh, you know decided to to go here. And, and in the beginning, that was good because we were helping weed out who's who's a natural good fit. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. to a degree, after a while, I started reflecting on. Yeah, you know, countless nights where I would just sit there myself and be like, you know, am I doing the right thing? Yeah, are we like, using our best people here? Like, yeah, and yeah, and maybe I'm leading by, yeah, leading in a wrong way. And so every time I'd have to wake up with that feeling, knowing that you know perhaps I'm doing something wrong. So, uh, so there were definitely some good days, some bad days. I, I think um, we 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 would have town hall meetings as an organ as a new company organization, and and we yeah. would, and we would. One of the things that I think helped a lot was the inclusiveness, uh, yeah. having everybody be inclusive. So I could have easily sat in one corner and just devise a big grand plan and uh, orchestrate it and just 
demand people follow that plan. But my plan was sort of, I had a plan, uh, clearly it worked, but I had a plan, but the plan started becoming more clear as I involved more key people, part of this team and trusting them that they're going to come in and, and help. So being transparent, uh, and I'm sure you've heard this uh, through your podcast with other leaders of just being transparent, being open, uh, not siloing people and yep. being as inclusive as possible definitely help motivating. And you you get, in my opinion, the very best ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I try to use uh, Steve Jobs' uh, philosophy. I don't think he ever uh, believed in it. I think he said it. He always talked about it, but I don't think he believed in it, which was, you know, Hiring the right people and them advising you and telling you what we should do versus you constantly telling people what to do. Yeah. Uh, and, and Surround yourself with people yeah. smarter than yourself, right? Yeah. Exactly. Surround yourself with smarter people than yourself in areas that they excel in. And now yeah. you have a really good team under your belt where you can achieve greatness. So hopefully I yeah. didn't get around that, that question too much and answered it. No, 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 no. It's super helpful. Um, so you, I mean, you, you get the team through this huge transformation. Um, you, you're doing it through COVID. Where does that lead you to next? So I get them through COVID. We, uh, go live with the New York office. Uh, yeah. knock on wood, nothing broke <laughs> back, back now. It's almost been three years. Uh, yeah long three years since since i left them to see partners uh and then and the everything is still working and in fact uh the cio that took over after i left after i i sort of said hey i'm, I'm going a new way in a new direction um uh my, my understanding he hasn't changed one thing in fact okay. i think we're gonna change it's kind of the branding and the name which again it's you know somebody who wants to always leave an imprint and some change but but it, it says that to me, it's not even an ego thing. It just says to me that, okay, the, what we put in place worked actually. Mm-hmm. And that, that was a, more of a gratitude uh, thing for me. Um, so we land the plane, so to speak. We transform uh, the organization and, and uh, everybody now has laptops. We, we actually yep. you know, become almost like a distribution center, which was insane. We had to launch 5,000 laptops worldwide. What? Because yeah. again, like this was a, you know, global organization, we have countries mm-hmm. all over the place. Uh, and you deal, you know, when you're sending a laptop, people, people forget this, right. You know, customs and foreign country. Oh, and logistics are a nightmare. Logistics are a nightmare. So we had to actually become a center in order to achieve that goal. Yeah. Um, push, create that security blanket. Uh, and then we use kind of the architecture that we build at one world trade center to build future campuses. Around okay. in the U.S. and in uh, NIM. so I I finished the transformation, and then the bigger goal is we have to get through this acquisition. So uh, MDC Partners was going to be acquired by Stagwell uh, Group, okay. a private yep. entity arm that was also led by Mark Penn. He had investors such as the Bomber, uh, all these famous people but behind the scenes, and so. Uh, and our goal was through the transformation was to get the stock back up. Obviously, we yeah. were all advised by stock, and so we, uh, I, I positioned the company in a really good place from a public from a public side because we were a publicly traded company. Mm-hmm. Apple was not bringing these two companies by the fall. We were going to bring them into the public into the public eye. So we had to sort of um, have a really good security and control posture, um, and uh, and that was difficult do but we did it yeah. and uh and then we got them through the acquisition and at that point i just naturally felt i've done my good deed i've done everything i i aim to do i was the young uh, cio for a publicly traded company so that was a nice goal that that was yeah. a check mark there and i finally performed a transformation that was worthy of success and a successful one that did not disrupt the business in a negative way and up until then i had never seen that before Every transformation mm. I had been part of, not having been a CIO, not having been able to make decisions, didn't end so well. And so seeing that it not only it ended, but the stock actually was a good attributor. The stock yeah. went other to almost about $12. The stock is not trading so well today. I'm not, 
Hey, but you're not there, man. So <laughs> I, I like to think because I'm not there. Um, but but also... it's, not, it's not spurious correlation to think. Okay, stock <laughs> whilst well, you were there trended upwards. What was what was what was interesting for me too was I started to kind of see the writing of the wall for the industry itself. Okay, yeah. Like, so, uh, wasn't doing so well. I didn't have a lot of confidence. I it was one of my favorite um, industry, and in agree it still is. I mean, I, I learned so much, but it was such a cool thing to work for an advertising uh, company. And our Bagel Friday, got to wear jeans and t-shirts and be cool yep. and see all the cool advertisements that we would do. So there was definitely something cool about it in Aura, but I kept seeing the writing on the wall that it's a sort of a dying breed, a dying industry. Yeah, and wasn't quite sure if I wanted to stick around for for very long. So this was my way out. I already had established myself as a CIO. I made my name, and I'm now in this clubhouse. In sort of now, you can, you know, it's always about, in in my opinion, it's always about who's going to give you a chance. And if you see most CIOs, they're just people who sort of uh, stayed in the same role and eventually kind of graduated to that. Yeah, or they just, you know. They became a CIO. It goes back to that uh, model I was telling you about that, in my opinion, a really good CIO today should be somebody who has 80% technology background, 20% business, which is a sort of a, a newer way of thinking. And somebody who's actually, if you're going to be a CIO, somebody who's climbed to that ladder of uh, working in the, that game. Yeah. Me- when I was the, when I when I was CIO for NBC Partners, as I was restructuring the team, because I had to sort of flatten the group and restructure the team for growth, mm. because if I was going to motivate anybody, it was it was why am I staying here? Why am I going to be with John so I can continue to just be this level one hub technician? No, we're going to give you opportunity for growth. So we structured it with a flat organization to be able to grow from there. And uh, when I would speak with the help desk technicians or the network administrator or the, with the project manager or the global head of support. I knew how to speak to them because I've been mm-hmm. in, most CIOs have never been in that role. In fact, my, what's, what's the typical kind of, yeah. What's the typical what's, background of most CIOs that you would most, encounter? Most, I mean, they come from a really good school, which I'm not knocking. Yeah. I came from yeah, yeah. a decent school. I didn't come from Harvard or anything like that. And again, I'm not knocking that, but it's, they, they come out of these prestigious schools with business degrees and all sorts of things, and they jump right into an IT director role or a DP right. Role, right into it, and they have no experience whatsoever on how a support uh, team should run, how you should kind of lead a team, how a support technician behaves and the culture they have embedded in their mind and stuff. And they don't know nothing of it. In fact, sure. I'll say this, I'm not going to mention them or well, their name but I can remember meeting the global CIO at the time at WPP, and he came right up to me and he's like, hey, "I'm not going to emulate his voice, but he was. <laughs> I, I don't know how to how to use this blood and keyboard. I don't know how to use this mouse. Can you help right. me speak the conference room?" And I'm sitting there and I'm like, "You're the one who's yeah. the American can even set up a conference room on your own." Yeah, and, and that that further instilled to me. You're a true executive that sits up here and doesn't know what's happening down here. Yeah, and it's going to hinder you long term. Yeah. And so I didn't, I didn't want to be that. Um, and uh, and so I, I wanted to have my ear in the ground, and I had to balance how to be, not be in the weeds and just balance enough to be close to the business, but not too close. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's having the richness of insight and context to inform the best possible decisions. And if you don't have that understanding how could you ever make the most well constructed contextual decisions about what the team needs and how they work like yeah, that's yeah. A, so uh get the acquisition done got the stock up everybody's happy and then i go and i uh put in my resignation and uh that was why, why, why are you resigning it just feels like this has been your time you've done what you came and set up to do so it, it, it felt it felt the, the company was going a different direction. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't necessarily aligned with that direction. There was really? the, there was the writing the wall of advertising isn't isn't. I, I just didn't see that it's going to kind of survive long term. At yeah. least the at least the holding company structure. I think smaller uh, boutique agencies are going to thrive. The larger organizations are, aren't. And and I think three years if you look back and look at the trajectory, 
I was kind of right. Most of these holding companies, their stock has kind of dropped. Investors are mm-hmm. not investing in it. And a lot of the uh, clients are pulling back on ad spend and they're either bringing it in house or they're hiring a boutique small agency who gets where we should be mm-hmm. going and stuff versus yeah. the traditional model. So there was that. There was the. I, I don't want to get emotional about it, but uh, my wife and my kids not seeing me. That's huge, We're, man. That's huge. I, I was not uh, there. I, I remember going to my son's uh, graduation. Uh, he was graduating from uh, kindergarten to go to grade school. First yeah. first graduation that a parent should be there. And I remember I I almost missed it. I did get there. And in our leadership call, um, uh, Jason uh, Jason brought up, he said, uh, well, John is not attending. And everybody freaked out. They're like, John attends every single call. Why, why is he not? Yeah. He's going to his son's graduation. But it's like, oh my God, he, he has a family. We thought to just <laughs> talk. Yes. And, uh, and, yeah. and, and sort of, I saw that. And uh, I was like, I can't, you know, I know providing to your family is very important. But if you're not, if you're an absentee father, I think that's probably the worst thing you could do. Sure. And so I wanted to spend time with my family. That was probably the most important thing. So I spent the next four or five months um being sort of with my family uh and figuring out what did i want to do next i didn't want to jump Great. into anything right away i could take my time i didn't need yeah. any model the stock the stock did did well as i said before but that kept me that kept me going so I, I didn't need any of that and funny enough my my wife who i love so much she's been an amazing partner she's been a, actually you know, behind a successful man is a successful woman, in my very strong opinion. She was the one who orchestrated me and planted the seed of getting to where I am today. I sure. wouldn't have got it. In, in fact, and I don't want to go back too much because we, we got a little out of time here, but uh, yeah, the, yeah. your WPB decision to MDC, that was all her. Uh, if yeah. it was up to me, I probably would have still stayed out WPB and I probably would have okay. become CIO. It's just that timing, and they say about timing and luck and, and influence. I just had uh, one of the best partners to tell me and guide me what, what to do. Um, and she definitely smarter than me. She went to. <laughs> but yeah, I, more, you know, I still kind of reflect back and say, I don't know what she's doing. I think at some point I fixed her computer, and she was very happy about that. And that's how she found the most. It's a joke. Anyways, um, so now I'm like, home. Uh, everybody's everybody's like, oh my god, dad's back, cool, yeah, yeah. and he's and he's focused. Um, but I became super focused, and my OCD, AD, ADHD kicked in, and so now my wife is like, okay, you're driving us all crazy here. You're cleaning the house every day. You're doing all sorts of things. You need to, so uh, I can see like you're itching. You need to go out yeah. and plant your your name again and, and do something, and so. Uh, again, I was in no rush, so I sort of explored a couple of options. Uh, funny enough, Disney uh, was was one option. Yep. My wife was the executive vice executive vice president for learning and development at Disney, and uh, so she got me talking to them because they were looking for a CTO for Disney Plus. Yeah, uh, it was uh, a Bruce American Tobacco. There was all sorts of opportunities that I was exploring, uh, but didn't feel right, and. Uh, you asked me in the beginning of the, the, the sort of interview was, um, you know, how did I get to Mike Morse? And uh, yeah. it was just funny. I just I just kept getting a phone call from a law. It just, you know, my caller ID kept saying law firm. Yeah. I was like, I'm not picking this call up. I, I didn't know. I didn't know who it was. They weren't leaving a voicemail. Um, and uh, I thought it was, it might be related to the sort of acquisition, right? Yeah, yeah. Acquisition sometimes, yeah. See or something. So I am not. I don't have anything to do with this. I'm not picking up the phone. And uh, finally, they left a voicemail, and it was a headhunter. Uh, yeah. And uh, they basically said, "Hey, we're we're with the Mike Morse Law Firm, and you know, we we want to talk to you. So can you please pick up? We really want to talk yeah. to you." And at, um, long story short, I I got to do a little bit of background in law firm. Can't see myself working for a law firm, and yeah. my wife again just kept saying to me, "You know, you should give them a chance. They seem like a really good organization. You'll get to work um, 
remotely and and not have to kind of go back into the office constantly. Yeah. Because again, when when COVID kind of loosened up a little bit, I was always at World Trade. Yeah. Sure. Make sure that the build out was happening correctly. I, I even have pictures of my kids bringing them with me to wear the hard hats. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or I had to be with me in, during construction. Um, and so you, you'll get to work remotely and they look like a really good organization. And we should chat. And uh, so I scheduled my first meeting with uh, Michael Morse, John Nakiezo, who's our chief operating officer, and Justin Lee, our CFO. And that was really interesting to me because, I, 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 you know, when we think of a traditional law firm, they don't really have a CFO. Sure, they no. maybe have somebody in accounting or they outsource at accounting. They, they definitely don't have a chief operating officer. Uh, they might have a chief of staff, but usually it's partners. And it's really, mm. really never run as a business, if you think about it, it's run as a traditional rigid law firm. Sure, yeah. so I, was, I, was, I was sort of interested. I was like, okay, they have a CEO and a CFO. Well, that's interesting. And I got on the call. I got on the call. We had a Zoom call. And Michael Moore shows up. And uh, he had the cool hair. He's wearing a hoodie, a T-shirt. Um, I don't want to say. I, I don't know, I'll say it. Uh, every other word was f this, f that. And it okay. was right up my alley. And I was like, oh, okay, because I was expecting this guy's real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was expecting lawyers. I was expecting a suit and stuff. And uh, in comes in a crazy CEO, a true visionary, actually. Hey. How do we? The, the problem he's, he's having and how he loves technology and how he wants to be a tech first organization and, and how he wants to be the first firm to really adapt a really cool technology. And I thought, okay, that's cool. Um, and it's got- from your perspective, law firms, legal systems, using kind of antiquated <laughs> systems, antiquated <laughs> platforms. Yeah. So, so much scope for kind of innovation, a- I guess. A- absolutely. And, and so, as I started to think about what did I want to do next, hey. it was more important to me to sort of leave a legacy behind. I knew, you know, I might not have an opportunity to work with the Elon Musk and launch a space shuttle somewhere, leave a name. I might not be able to invent and or do something like that. So, but if I can leave my imprint that I was able to instill change, do something actually positive, that would be cool. And, you know, coming from advertising, I, I remember taking trips into the city and I would see one billboard that said, you know, advertising, you know, uh, please don't smoke, smoke and kill. And then the following advertisement would be, you know, Marlboro, the best cigarette. Not, not okay, what, are we, what are we doing? It's not like we're doing something um, that's that that can help, you know, humans achieve something more yeah. people and stuff. And so when I looked at the firm and I looked what they were doing and how they help people, that was inspiring. Ooh. That's a little cheesy and cliche. Uh, uh, oh, it's not cheesy or cliche. I think um, internally with impact, we think a lot about we call it like our evolutionary purpose. Yeah, um, and I think it's so important for an organization that you work for to have a very clear stated purpose in terms of what it, what is it there to functionally contribute to society. That's right. Um, and it's the thing that gets you up in the morning. It's the thing that really motivates you to work because yeah. like money only gets you so far. You need to be bought into the principles of what it is your organization is trying to achieve that's exact you're spot on i mean and i had made mine so the mom wasn't yeah. a driver anymore for me what no. would driver can i do something that will impact people in a positive way can yeah. i do something that uh will impact an industry and yeah. how they're thinking and adapting technology in a really positive way and that will be my legacy and so um so i went down to detroit met with everybody i still wasn't sold on it you know, yeah. uh, 100%. And uh, as I was about to leave, uh, Michael Morse asked me, he said, you know, give it, a, give it a really good thing, but look, we'd like you to be part of us. I think we could do something special. And John Mock Hazel uh, asked me to stay behind for about five minutes. And he's, a, he's one of the smartest people I've met. He's uh, one, of the, one of the people that inspires me every day to work. Uh, to work. Hey. And uh, definitely uh, somebody, you know, a father figure and somebody that I look up to and respect. And so he asked me to stay behind. He said, look, I can see it in your eyes. You're really not interested in working for us. And that's okay. I, I, I respect that. Well, what if I told you that we have a consulting arm called Fireproof, that we Dude. help other law firms. And if you help us build a blueprint of how we should evolve and how we should no longer be antiquated and get to a great place, you can actually help 
you know, all these other firms and we touch over a hundred firms that we Dude. help consult and we help on the operation side. And now you can sort of be this, I don't like the word fraction of CIO because I don't, I don't think it's a, it's a right word. It feels cheapy, but yeah. sort of becoming their CIO because none of them have a CIO, none of them yeah. have vision, none of them have a good team to kind of take them to where they need to be. And you can help them in so many areas. And, and that's what I bought into. I said, wow, okay, if I can do that, now I can actually start changing this entire landscape. And that's it. Yeah. And so two years later, I successfully transformed 17 law firms going on 18 now, which is nuts. Uh, it's nuts. It's crazy, man. Oh, a huge accomplishment. It is. It is. And, and luckily, they've given me, uh, we're talking about autonomy. So John and, and Michael have both given me the uh, autonomy that I need to be successful. Um, they give me great guidance. And uh, I've been able to do it remote. I still get to travel uh, to, to, to a degree. Uh, I, I try not to travel too much because I don't want yeah, to yeah, yeah. the family too much. But I get to travel to see and meet new clients, understand their technology stack, and transform them. And we've made some amazing partnerships with Microsoft. That was a, a huge bus coming in this industry. They, uh, yeah. Legal is already naturally on on some level of Microsoft Windows based yeah. based right because they're sort of the, the conservative group versus advertising which was a mixed bag of PC and Macs and yeah. I would say that that reflecting back that was always a harder transformation to do because not every yeah. wanted to have a PC not every yeah. wanted to be in a Mac and some agencies were on 365 some agencies were on G Suite how do you bring all that together? And, and, and bring it under sort of the glass. And so the, it, it was a, a benefit being in this industry because now all I have to do is sort of accelerate the direction of going from on-prem to yeah. the cloud using Microsoft services. And we partnered with Microsoft to push out the Surface laptops, which was a huge win. We sure. partnered with them on Intel, on Power BI. We started building... You guys are like all in for we the got, full suite of Microsoft, yeah. All in, and we went from being uh, uh, considered as a small biz, small medium business, to corporate enterprise, as what Microsoft now calls us. Um, and it, it's funny because coming on board and becoming the CIO and having all this experience that I had, there was there was this great benefit of bringing the 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 public sector experience that I had so that security and control and how to be a little diplomatic and how to get things done and stuff like that to now being in this nimble private environment where I can, I don't have to do RFPs. I mean, Ali, I used to hate RFPs. Sydney, I'm sitting here. <laughs> You're not alone there, man, seriously. <laughs> months, and I feel that's, that's a key contributor to a lot of CIOs not being successful because you spent yeah. eight months. So much bureaucracy. Yeah. And then you can't get anything done. And so for us, we still do some vetting. We don't just go off and just say, we're going to go here. But yeah. the process takes under two weeks. In two weeks, I've selected a partner who I'm going to partner with. We've negotiated a good agreement because we know that, you know, we're not 10, 50,000 people that we're going to achieve some great costs. And, and trust me, because I already have a benchmark coming from the enterprise, mm -hmm. I beat our partners up pretty good in, in respect to pricing. Uh, but but that achieves what that helps is it helps being able to transform quick, and if you yeah. do that, you change faster and you adapt faster. And if you do that, guess what? You see your return of investment back. So my old CEO, uh, CEO who I steal certain lines from him because I respect him still. Uh, his motto back in Harvard was, and in Cambridge. Uh, and I'm referring to the great Martin Sorek, was uh, uh, speed and persistence. Hey. If you're, if you can apply speed and get things done fast, and you're persistent about it, uh, sky's the limit. And so, and in that, if you look back and you see, and you say 17 going on 18 firms that have transformed in under two years, it's you know quite an accomplishment. And like I said, I didn't... Are the, yeah, are those the kind of two principles that you say underscore pretty much your approach to those law firms to make more speed and persistence? Or is there anything else? Yeah, I wish it was my motto so I can... Oh, I, uh, yeah, it's a good one, though. I feel so... it is a great one, and I didn't understand it at the time. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah didn't understand it at the time until I started applying it. And that's when it started resonating. 
okay, if I'm persistent enough and I go and I push and I get what we need and I can do it in a fast way, things happen, uh, you, you achieve a lot more. What have you learned about, yeah. I'll separate them out a little bit. What have you learned about speed over the years? Speed? How you approach that? Yeah. Um, speed isn't always good. Okay. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're in a really fast car, eventually speed is fun during the time and during the moment, but you can always crash and burn okay. or you could get pulled over and get a really expensive ticket. Uh, so speed isn't always great a hundred percent of the time because you can fall and stumble and make some mistakes. And, um, oh, that's why most CIOs are kind of, yeah, take the really... foot off the gas. Let's, let's coast a little bit, you know, yeah. I don't want to get in trouble. It's well, a conservative viewpoint, right? Last time we spoke, we talked about the CIO that I mentioned that, you know, he was, uh, uh, talking about how he was able to transform a, a company, one company with not even 17 companies that I did, but one company. And it took him five years and he was boasting about it that, hey, I, I did it in five years. It could have been 15 years, but I did it in five years. Yeah. And I, uh, I said, well, what you did in five years, I do in five months. So, but, but to your point, CIOs either are hindered by the organization itself to be resistant to change and take mm -hmm. their time. Some CIOs don't want to transform too quick because there's this natural fear, and I don't understand why, but there's a natural fear of uh, job uh, security. Of Yeah. If I do it so quickly and I get them, they're going to be so efficient afterwards that what happens to me? And that's not true. It, in fact, if you do it quicker, the company will see value in that and they'll position you to do something more strategic. And by the way, technology and the true transformation, it never really ends, Ali. No, 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 absolutely. I mean, it's the yeah. world we're living in now, it is right. rapidly changing. Absolutely. So you, you, you just have to, in my opinion, the transformation is a sprint to fill yeah. it. Once you fill that big gap, now it's just maintaining it. And uh, it used to be that you could get away with a couple of months, a year, maybe two years, get away yeah. with not putting in the investment technology today with what's happening with our favorite uh, word AI uh, uh, or two letters AS on um, you you have to be sharpening that board every day yeah. every minute I mean it's just fascinating to the, the direction we're heading so, yeah. um, so is, it, is it is it insecurity that's driving people to operate slower than they ought to? That I, and I think it's sort of the older model CIO of of you know they say you, you can't uh, teach uh, an old dog new tricks. I don't believe that so much, but 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 yeah. I believe that it's relevant to them. The CIOs who, who are naturally resistant for themselves to change and change their way of thinking and adapting mm -hmm. and uh, and doing things, and so they're just going to move slow. And slow um, isn't always great. And uh, even though even though you you heard the story right of the the hare and the tortoise and the tortoise wins at the end, slow isn't always uh, always right. So speed, yeah. the right speed, the can right be speed, very beneficial. Too much speed, I think, can uh, can lead to some negative disruption and uh, make poor decisions. How do you know when you're worth, how do you know when you're running too fast? Follow the telltale signs. When when things start breaking apart, <laughs> <laughs> it won't tell for him, but um, that's a good question. Um, luckily, I've made some not great decisions, but but I've made a lot of good decisions. Hey. Uh, I'm also of the opinion that you sort of um, have to make some bad decisions once in a while. Uh, uh, if you're not making bad decisions, you're not learning. You don't learn, right? So, so, so you have to learn from that, but also... Um, going back to that RFP that I was telling you about, like, for the love of God, make a decision, right? Yeah. I'd rather make a bad decision than make no decision, right? Mm -hmm. Whole, you know, um, uh, paralysis by analysis is true. You sit there yeah. and analyze thinking, and trust me, this is coming from somebody who I suffered from true OCD. That I have to, everything has to be perfect. I mean, I built this new house and I'm probably, the, the contract is probably committed to us. I'm joking. I'm joking, but <laughs> for a job, the attention to detail. It's it's what, it's good. So, but that perfection can really hurt you. And so yeah. you, have to, you have to know when not to be too perfect. You have to know when 
uh, not to be going too fast, but definitely for the love of God, don't go too slow. Don't. It's it's going to hurt everybody in your organization, and especially in today's world where you have to move at a faster pace to be a of technology. Yeah. And then finally, the second piece of that persistence. What does what does it look like to be persistent, and how have you yeah. changed your approach over the years? Um, persistence is, in my opinion, a good trait. It suits me very well. Uh, I'm naturally persistent. I've always been persistent over the persistent persistent since uh, the the minute I came out of my mother's womb. I, I was resistant to even one <laughs> tough persistent. Yeah. Um, so it, it's done me well. I don't know if it can do everybody well, um, but it's also caused me to be in a hot seat a couple right so okay. being able to balance that I've had, I've had to learn that and, and know when to be incredibly persistent and when to sort of say you know what I'm not going to die on this hill I'm not going to fight Dude. it's not worth it it's not it, it's not going to go anywhere and so picking and choosing that time to be persistent that I think is uh, incredibly important and, and knowing why you're being persistent if you're truly passionate about it and you know that um, that it's gonna do right. I mean, you might not be hundred percent right, but you know that it's going to. Sh it should have a positive end outcome. You should always be persistent about that. Uh, you should be persistent in life in general, right? Persistent about your dreams. Persistent mm -hmm. about getting things done and stuff. The goals that you have. Because if you're not persistent, in my opinion, you're never going to get to them, right? If you're not persistent yeah. enough. Goals are uh, meant to achieve them, and if you're not going to be persistent enough, then don't even put those goals up there because you're not. You're not, in my opinion. So, um, but it it for for sure it's been sort of this like the the speed and you know, the persistence, the speed knowing and balancing when to be and when not to be. Same thing with persistence because I've yeah. been, uh, I've been in the hot seat too many times that I want to remember uh, where being too persistent has caused kind of. Uh, a negative effect um yeah and you know take it take it for, for 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 what it's worth but it's it's a balance and knowing when and i just over time i've become a little bit more seasoned i've definitely gotten more gray hairs uh but with that time i've, I've learned how to balance things more and, and evolve which i think yeah. is also a, a, a good thing i think i wonder if there's one more thing to go with speed and persistence that's focus because so often you can be fast and persistent. We can be doing it across a range of different areas. I mean, like I, I feel I'm personally quite susceptible to that. I'm quite ADHD. So if I'm actually working on projects, I'm working like 10 concurrent projects at the same time. But trying to be persistent and deliver those quickly is really challenging. Does that resonate with you at all? A hundred percent. I remember my physics teacher in the... So I, I grew up in Greece and then Greece, they teach you physics from... Yeah. Or it's fifth grade for the for the love of God. So by sixth grade, teacher would tell my father, "Your son is brilliant, but he has the focus and the attention span of the of a butterfly. I mean, if he could put his attention span and focus, he would achieve great things." Yeah, uh, I, I, I'd love to see him because I'd love to. <laughs> I'm sure he'd be, be really be, proud. Be, so, yeah, he'd be proud. Of. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, and I have a very short attention span. Um, and, and in my opinion, most visionary people do. And I'm I'm a, I'm both a visionary and an integrator, meaning that I have a vision of where technology should be, and I can yeah. integrate and I can make it happen. Uh, so it's a nice little balance. Mer Michael Morris is a true visionary. His attention span is as short as me, and that's why we get along. Yeah. Uh, and so I think when it comes to transformations, when it comes to what I do, I have to be focused. Yeah. Um, but I have to also learn how to balance because I've done 17, 18 firms and in these firms, despite the fact that I've transformed them in their eyes, I'm still their CIO. So I have to balance now 18 firms who come to me constantly with advice of what do we do here? What do we do here? So yeah. balancing that and being able to focus. And like I said, I have a great team around them. So they help me balance that focus. So everything from, uh, the, the great Danielle, which I know you've met, uh, yeah. Who serves my guardian and guards my time? The gatekeeper, and, yeah. <laughs> she's my gatekeeper. I mean, everything goes through her, and that's important as well because that helps me balance my schedule yeah. and not burn out. Uh, focus is incredibly important because 
you know what? You just gave me my new motto. Speed, persistence, and focus. That's going to be my motto. You're welcome. So you have to. Thank you. Ali, I'm going <laughs> to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, but focus is equally important. You have to be focused on on what you're doing. And it's yeah. okay to not have 100% of your focus, but focus is important. Uh, without it, you, you, you're, without it, uh, your great ideas can't be can't be uh, pulled out and extracted and given to, to the right people if you don't the right mm. the right time. Focus. And sometimes we'll see me. Uh, I say to my team, if I'm not giving you my focus, that's a bad thing. Yeah, that yeah, means yeah. I'm not caring enough, and that's a bad thing for everybody. And so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that, that level of self awareness is so important because I think it's very possible for you to want to be focused on something or somebody and not actually be and you need other people to call you out when when that happens right i love that i love i, I love that and i'm not somebody who suffers from that ego like even yeah. when they see call me out tell me if i'm yeah. doing something and, and do it look do it in a respectful way everybody wants yeah. <laughs> to say you you ass you're not paying attention i'm spending all my time in here but yeah, but yeah. Do, what because to me I, I i love that it just okay yeah you know we're, we're at that same level it doesn't doesn't you know it's not like in the military you have to salute you or something like that because i don't see <laughs> I, this would be at everybody's level this way we have good conversations and people yeah. don't fear that's another thing of the fear of i used to it wasn't for me it wasn't fear but part of that persistence was i always had the courage to be able to speak my mind i was always told to John G, you have no filter, and I don't know if it's because you're, you're from New York or you're Greek or whatever. You definitely wear your heart in your sleeve, and that has gotten to where I am. It's also hindered me in some cases as well. <laughs> you know, everybody gets frightened for intimidated when you're speaking your mind. They're not used to that. So I'd imagine it's more feature than bug, really. Yeah, for yes. sure. Yeah, yeah, for <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, John, well, let's, let's pause it there for the meantime. Um, I'm really keen to pick up with you again and dig deep into your thoughts around generative AI, but that's for probably another episode. But uh, thank you so much for your time today, talking me through your journey. It's been amazing. Thank you, Ali. It's been awesome. And yeah, look forward to a second round, definitely talking about AI. It's the way of the future now. So cool. Happy to yeah. Do what we're doing. So. <laughs> cool. Thanks, John. Yeah. Awesome.